What is going on, guys? Thank you so very much for joining me right here on Off The Script. I got a little bit of extra for you. It is July 1st, 2022. I am JD from New York. As always, coming to you from the OTS venue. Thank you guys so very much for joining me on your Friday afternoons, wherever you may be. Social media went into a meltdown yesterday when WWE announced that Logan Paul was signed to World Wrestling Entertainment with a multi-year deal. I don't like it, but I don't mind it at the same time. We will go over what was said yesterday. We will go over how I feel about this situation and why I'm not looking at it like I usually would look at something like this and this situation. Logan Paul will be in the WWE, and we'll talk about it today on OTS. Also... Io Shirai, she may not be with the WWE. At least for the next month, she'll be with the WWE. But after that, I don't know what to tell you, man. Her contract is set to expire. WWE has offered her a contract. She's turned it down. Reportedly, she wants to go back to Japan. And all I'm asking myself is how you let someone like that walk out of your company when she should be the absolute number one face of your division. Also, we'll go over Forbidden Door buy rates. And I got the news on why Jim Ross is now taking a part-time schedule in AEW. Also, Jeff Hardy, I got news on his update. Apparently, he's pleaded not guilty. Not guilty, Jeff Hardy, to his latest DUI arrest. All this plus so much more. Make sure you guys follow me on social media at JD from NY206. That's Twitter and Instagram now on TikTok, also on Cameo. Thank you guys for all the love on Cameo, man. You guys are blowing me away with all the support on Cameo. Links for everything are down in the description below. Make sure you guys go hit that subscribe button down below. We just hit 134,000 subscribers and continuing to grow on a daily basis. Thank you guys so very much. Turn on that bell for notifications and if you missed any of the content this week and i was in chicago for the big forbidden door pay-per-view make sure you go back and check everything out from this week it is all on the home page right now if you want more ots also i can't forget 1000 likes on today's ots extra that is 1000 minimum on today's podcast logan paul we're gonna start off with the logan paul situation man this is a big story uh, this actually blindsided everybody yesterday. I was actually on the road, and I had people texting me, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? What do you think of this? I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ, they can't be serious with this shit. Logan Paul signs a multi-year WWE contract, and Ariel Hawani broke the news on his podcast yesterday, and he says this, and I quote, Logan Paul has signed a deal with WWE, just announced on Twitter. Per sources, it's a multi-year deal to compete at multiple events per year. No return date set, but could be next month at SummerSlam. Miz would make a lot of sense. Logan Paul is somebody that a lot of people were praising at WrestleMania, me included. So when I thought about this and I seen this, all breaking on social media. I didn't really know what to think. Ariel Hawani goes on to say, additional details per source. Deal includes an undisclosed number of premium live events across 2022 and 2023. He'll likely, I'm told, have his first big appearance at SummerSlam, but could be on TV before that. He signed his deal yesterday, and that was from Ariel Hawani on Twitter. He reported this news on social media yesterday. Now, the news, as it pertains to Logan Paul, uh, no terms of the deal were discussed. Ariel Hawani talked about this. And Miz, on Monday, if you guys watch Monday Night Raw, Miz, on Monday, said that he and Paul were returning as a tag team and would be competing at SummerSlam. It's still unclear exactly what WWE has planned for the Miz or Logan Paul at this time. And SummerSlam, WWE hasn't really announced anything but... Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar for the undisputed heavyweight championship. So, I don't know what to think about this, man. I really don't. On one hand, and I'm being brutally honest with you guys. On one hand, I want to shit all over this. I do. It's in my nature to shit all over this. 
but I'm not going to. Do I like this move? No, I don't. I don't like this move. But from me to you guys, you know I would never bullshit you, okay? I don't like this move. The first thing that comes to mind is, well, why isn't WWE putting all their effort into creating somebody that could take the spot of Roman Reigns and take the spot of a John Cena when they are no longer able to be there? What happens to the future of the company? Is the future of the company going to be in the hands of fucking Logan Paul? Is the future of the company going to be in the hands of somebody else that the fans don't want or the fans are going to reject? I don't like this move because WWE always does the same fucking thing and they put so much effort into everybody else but their own fucking roster. So I don't like it. I don't. But I'm also not going to shit on it because I don't know what to expect. And I'm not going to shit on it because let's be real. If you want to boil WrestleMania down to a couple of things and stand out things that happened that weekend, Logan Paul is probably in the top three things that happened on that weekend, right below Stone Cold Steve Austin and Cody Rhodes. Logan Paul had a dynamic performance at WrestleMania. He had a better performance than Pat McAfee, and Pat McAfee is good in his own right. But I don't like the move because WWE always does this and they... They really tell you where their priorities lie. They don't give a shit about pro wrestling. They don't give a shit about their fans. They don't give a shit about making the next Roman Reigns or the next Cody Rhodes or the next John Cena. They they don't give a shit about that. They want what they want now. They want what's in now. They want what's popular now only to get ahead for themselves. They don't want to put the work in in starting over from scratch and building somebody from the ground up and then maybe potentially turning into the next Roman Reigns or the next Cody Rhodes or the next John Cena. They don't want that. And I don't like that. They don't have any patience. The fans don't have any fucking patience. WWE wants to deviate away from fucking pro wrestling as far as they can. The fans are not going to have patience and they're going to deviate away from what WWE is presenting. That's why AEW exists. I don't like it, but I don't mind it. Logan Paul being on WWE television, we don't know. He could be there every week. He could be there once a quarter for all the quarterly premium live events. We don't know. We don't know what his contract is going to entail. We don't know who he's going to work with. We don't know how he's going to be used. We don't know the capability of Logan Paul at this stage of the game. For all we know, he knows how to fucking wrestle, and we just don't know. He can wrestle, but what we saw at WrestleMania, I think he gets the gist of what is going on and how to move and how to work in that ring. If WWE uses Logan Paul in a way where it's not overexposing him and he's there once a quarter or at WrestleMania and at a SummerSlam, maybe they do two, three big matches for Logan Paul at these huge stadium shows and they want to put him on the card to help Enhanced ticket sales. WWE wants to, more, wants to run more stadium shows. If they use him twice to three times a year and give him a real special attraction feel, I don't really see the big deal in it. I don't. If he wants to come on in and work a WrestleMania and come on in and work a SummerSlam and call it a fucking year, fine. Fine. Why are you getting upset about Logan Paul working two matches per year? He's one man and one segment on a fucking three-hour Raw or a two-hour SmackDown. Five hours of TV time per week WWE gives us. None of it's really good, but he's one segment and 10 minutes, 15 minutes on a five-hour block of television every fucking week. Now, if Logan Paul's on TV every fucking week, then I'll have a problem, and I will deviate away from my opinion here, and I will give you the proper opinion uh, that calls for it because he should not be somebody that, be, that is on TV every week, and he should not be on TV every fucking week. He should not be taking roster spots away from somebody there full-time, somebody there that needs that prime TV time, somebody there that needs the company's backing and support and to get on TV that's there on the road every single week, every single week, and needs to be given that type of attention. If he starts taking that away from somebody, then I'll have a fucking problem. If he's on TV taking that away from somebody, I will have a fucking problem. But we don't know. We don't know. We don't know what any of this means. If he wrestles twice, three times per year, at a Rumble, in the Rumble, at WrestleMania, at SummerSlam, what is the big deal? What is the big deal? 
And to be quite honest with you, Logan Paul actually made The Miz, and, and this is one of the things I really, I don't really care about The Miz, but this is one of the things that actually stood out to me. The Miz is fucking awful television by himself. Nobody gives a shit about The Miz unless his wife is on TV. And nobody gives a shit about Maurice's, uh, uh, The Miz's wife in Maurice uh, uh, unless she's wearing scantily clad outfits. She's there. She's eye candy for everybody. So nobody gives a shit about The Miz unless Maurice is on TV. Nobody cares about Maurice unless she's coming out half naked. So if The Miz is on TV without Maurice, The Miz is not good TV. And if The Miz is on TV with Logan Paul, I honestly think the dynamic would be good TV, whether they are tag team partners or whether they are feuding one-on-one. That may be where they go with this. I don't see them teaming up. I don't see them winning the tag team championships, especially being held by the Usos. But I do see them wrestling one-on-one at SummerSlam. Again, I don't mind it because it's just one match and one event. But if WWE gets too comfortable with Logan Paul and they want to use him and they want to use his star power and they want to use him for whatever the fuck they got to use him for and they overexpose him and they abuse it, then I'll have a fucking problem. But right now, I don't have a problem. And The Miz, being in there with The Miz, I mean, he's the safest worker in the entire fucking industry. So if you want Logan Paul to get in there and look good, The Miz is going to make Logan Paul look good and Logan Paul is going to do what he's got to do with The Miz because The Miz is the safest guy in the industry. I don't have a problem with this. I don't. I will have a problem if WWE goes against everything that I said here. And you look at SummerSlam, additionally, you look at SummerSlam, man. I also, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. On paper, it doesn't look good. You're looking at Pat McAfee and Baron Corbin at SummerSlam, and then you're more than likely looking at Logan Paul versus The Miz. WWE is getting very comfortable using outside sources to fill these major pay-per-views, these major stadium shows. I'm not for that. I'm not. That just goes to show you that WWE doesn't really have an idea uh, of how to use their talent. It it goes to show you that WWE absolutely, A, disrespects their talent, and B, is lazy on building new talent to get them to a point where they could fill seats in a major stadium show like a SummerSlam or like a Clash at the Castle. I don't like that aspect. You look at SummerSlam's card and WrestleMania's card— I get WrestleMania because WrestleMania has always had that celebrity appeal. But SummerSlam, you're looking at two of the major attraction matches being taken up by people who are not active WWE performers in Pat McAfee and Logan Paul. I guess they are. They're contracted to the company, but you guys know what I mean. Full-time performers in the company. They're giving those spots to people who are non-full-time performers in the company because they have bigger star power and bigger celebrity appeal than everybody else on the roster. Whose fucking fault is that? Whose fault is that? That's WWE's fault for being fucking lazy and not putting their, their effort into building the next major fucking star that will appeal to the fucking masses. I don't mind. I don't like it, but I don't mind it. If they use him the way that I documented here, then fine. I'll be for it. Don't overabuse him. Don't overexpose him. You know? Keep it at a level where he is a major attraction and comes in for two or three major shows per year. Everybody had a meltdown on social media. I don't like it, but I'm not going to shit on it because, and I'm not going to shit on it because of the performance he gave us at WrestleMania. He blew everybody away. He was very good, and he's a natural prick. He's a natural for this type of thing. You see somebody getting that type of heat, you wish somebody on the roster would get that level of heat. He knows how to work a crowd. He knows how to come in there and make people hate him. Some people that are there 10, 15 years still don't grasp the, 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 the natural concept of how do, I, how do I get the fucking fans to hate me? This guy walks in and people want to shit all over. So he's at least got that going for him. And he works it very well. We'll see. We'll see. He'll get it. And he'll, he looks like somebody that will get it and get better. If he's there more, he'll, he will get it instead of these random appearances just because it's WrestleMania. If he's there, he'll, he'll get the concept of what he has to do and what he has to do to kind of transition himself to get the fans even more hated on him. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this all plays out. But Logan Paul is now a WWE superstar, and we will see in the weeks to come what WWE does with him at SummerSlam and how they use him moving forward on their television programming. Jeff Hardy. Jeff Hardy pleads not guilty to a DUI that he just was a part of in Florida, June 28th to be exact. So we got this DUI situation pleaded not guilty on June 28th. 
Former WWE superstar and current AEW superstar is set for an arraignment on July 5th at 2.30 p.m. in regards to his June 13th arrest where he was charged with a DUI, his third offense in 10 years. He was also charged with driving with a canceled slash suspended slash revoked license. Per Tony Khan, AEW's uh, main man there, TK, Hardy entered a rehab facility on June 21 and he is currently suspended without pay. His return to the company depends on the completion of of the rehab. Khan issued these statements following the suspension announcement, and he said, and I quote, we were able to resume contact with Jeff Hardy this afternoon. AEW does not condone Jeff's alleged behavior. We made it clear to Jeff that we'll assist him in getting treatment for substance abuse issues, which he has indicated that he's open to receiving. In the interim, he is suspended without pay, and he can only return to AEW upon successfully completing treatment and maintaining his sobriety, end quote. I find it funny how he pleaded not guilty to a fucking DUI where he was pulled over and arrested for driving under the influence with a fucking revoked license. How, how, how does that even sound fucking right? I don't know how he intends on getting away with this and and getting these charges dropped when he has video of him all over social media drinking the night before, gets pulled over at 10.30 the following morning, he can't even fucking stand, he didn't know where he was going, he didn't know where he was coming from, and he failed a sobriety test worse than I've ever seen anybody fail a sobriety test, and apparently driving without a fucking license. I don't understand how he plans to sit there and say, yeah, I, I'm pleading not guilty. Typical fucking alcoholic behavior. Typical behavior of an alcoholic. I wish him nothing but the best. I really do. But the fact that he is not owning up to his mistakes and pleading not guilty, it, it goes to show you that he's Jeff Hardy and he feels he could get away with anything. I, I seriously hope Tony Khan sticks to his guns on this and, and doesn't play lightly. If there is any situation where he feels he is not getting better or not making progress or feels that he would be back on TV and then relapse again, I, I, if I'm Tony Khan, I'm not putting him on TV. I, I'm, not, I'm not putting my resources for AEW into Jeff Hardy at all. You got to teach the guy a lesson. You really do. They took a big risk, a big chance bringing him into the company, and now he goes and pleads not guilty to a fucking DUI where he was was clearly, clearly under the influence and driving without a fucking license, a revoked license. It's mind-boggling. I read this. I'm like, what? Unbelievable, man. I I seriously hope he gets the help he needs. Io Shirai. Io Shirai's WWE contract is set to expire soon. This was the news of the morning. Io Shirai has been one of the biggest names in the WWE women's division over the last several years. NXT's women's division, to be exact. The former NXT women's champion has been off television since April due to an injury as her last match was at NXT TakeOver Stand and or <coughs> I'm sorry. NXT Stand and Deliver. No more TakeOvers. NXT Black and Gold is dead. TakeOver is dead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. NXT stand in the lever. It was reported last week that Shirai was expected to return relatively soon. Nobody knows what the nature of the injury was. I know I seen her on social media in a couple of pictures, photographed with a boot on her foot. I don't know if it was a foot injury, an ankle injury, a leg injury. It seemingly happened in that, I believe they had a fatal four-way match at stand and deliver with Cora Jade, Mandy Rose, and uh, I believe it was Alba Fire, the former Kaylee Ray. So, I don't know what had happened. She was also a part of a ladder match on NXT 2.0 television that looked absolutely fucking brutal. It may have been due to the ladder match. She took one hell of a fucking bump in that ladder match. So nobody knows the nature of the injury, but she is due back relatively soon. Dave Meltzer reported in the latest edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter that she will become a free agent next month if she doesn't sign a new WWE deal. EO had reportedly told people in Japan that her contract was up and she wanted to return to to Japan to be closer to her husband and her family. This is a different situation from what Kairi Sane went through as Sane had to wait until the end of her contract to go to stardom because she left mid-contract and agreed to work as a representative 
for WWE over in Japan. There is no expectation in stardom that she will return at that point, but legally she could once her contract expires with World Wrestling Entertainment. Shirai first signed with the WWE back in 2017. In addition to her run as NXT Women's Champion, she is also a former NXT Women's Tag Team Champion. I can't help. WWE can't help. Nobody can help if EO wants to leave and go back to Japan. You're not going to convince her to stay if she wants to be closer to her family and closer to her husband. That's a decision that will come from EO and EO only. There's not going to be any outside source. There's not going to be any representative for WWE. There's not going to be any amount of money that's going to be able to keep her in the United States working for World Wrestling Entertainment if she solely desires to want to be back in Japan closer to her husband and her family. Let's put that out there right away. What I don't understand is in WWE, where they need, where they need women, star attraction, match of the year making women in WWE. You have Io Shirai in your grasp right now. You had Io Shirai before she got injured all that time when Io was in NXT, just waiting, waiting and waiting to get called up to the main roster, wasting away in NXT as she saw the fucking black and gold that she, that she was once a part of be fucking withered into nothing, deteriorated into nothing, and fucking killed right in front of her very eyes. That whole women's division absolutely gutted from the bottom up thanks to John Laurinaitis and Bruce Prichard taking over, Vince McMahon taking over. You have EO on this roster since 2017, and this woman is, it's still, it's 2022. It's July, fourth weekend, 2022, and this woman spent five years in NXT? This woman should have been on the main roster after a year and a half, max! And here she is, five years later, a part of the fucking fruit roll-up brand, Known as NXT 2.0. It's mind-boggling to me. It's mind-boggling to me how this woman, who should have been on the main roster, should have been given multiple women's championships across the main roster, made into a face of either division, matches with Charlotte, matches with Sasha, matches with Bailey, matches with Becky, matches with Asuka, matches with Bianca. These should have all been on the table, should have all been done. At least some of them at least should have been done, or at least some of them should have been on the table, remaining to give to the fan base of the WWE universe, right? How you have this woman on the main roster and she's not a staple in this division is absolutely a fucking sin. It is creative bankruptcy. It really is. It's creative malpractice. Now you're just going to let her willingly walk out of the WWE, make no effort at all, even though she's probably set in her ways. You've made no effort since she's been there, since she's been contracted there, made no effort to make her a staple of the company in a fucking day and age where WWE needs women like Io Shirai. You let Io go before this. You let Athena go before this. You let Dakota Kai go before this. You let Tony Storm go. Go, Ruby Soho, go, uh, amongst others that I'm sure I'm missing. But EO, if they imagine this, imagine that they're still stuck on Charlotte and Becky fucking in the cave looking for her golden fucking ring, right? And, and they let Sasha go. And they got Bailey set to come back any week now. I don't know what the fuck's taking them so long. Asuka's an embarrassment on the main roster. Bianca doesn't really feel like Bianca Belair anymore. She doesn't feel the same anymore. They are so stuck in their fucking... The women's division on Monday night and Friday night are fucking awful. But imagine WWE at one point or another at the same fucking time had Athena, Io, Dakota, Tony all on the payroll. And you mean to tell me you couldn't find anything for these women to do on the main roster? You weren't salivating at the fucking mouth with all that talent right in front of you not to bring them to the main roster and not to give us the best women's division on the fucking planet, which WWE had at one point or another, and now they don't. And now they don't. With every upcoming free agent... 
Tony Khan is strengthening his roster month by month by month. If Tony Khan was able to bring in Tony Storm, and probably if it's confirmed, Mercedes, who's to say EO doesn't go over there too? For all we know, this is what Meltzer's reporting. How often is Meltzer wrong? Quite. Who's to say Meltzer is, is right here? She wants to go back to stardom. She wants to go back to Japan. Who the fuck says she wants who, who the fuck says that's correct? And who's to say that she doesn't want to stay here, stay in Florida, and go work in Jacksonville? Could be. But what is mind-boggling to me is how this woman's been in NXT for 2000, since 2017 for five fucking years, and you don't have any fucking role for her on the main roster, and you made no attempt to make her the face of this fucking division? Why? I know why. I'm not going to say why, but you know why. WWE does not treat international talent the way that they should because of A, how they look, and B, they don't speak proper English. That's what they look forward to, and that's not what Io Shirai is. They don't deem Io Shirai capable of cutting a promo on the main roster. They don't deem Io as beautiful as anybody else that they would normally bring in on the main roster. Io is not blonde. Io is not made of plastic. It's unbelievable. It is unbelievable to me. I can't... Look, I don't give a shit. Whatever WWE wants to do, they're going to go and do it, man. Whatever is a loss for AEW is... Or, or WWE... Whatever is a loss for WWE, it is AEW's game. That's all I will... That's all I'll say here. I mean, it's fucking ridiculous. Io Shirai should be on the main roster. She, as, she should be at the prestige of where Becky Lynch is right now. And if you don't understand that and you don't agree with that, you ain't a fucking... Uh, uh, you, you don't know... You don't know talent. You don't know what the fuck this company needs. WWE doesn't even know what the fuck they need, but if you don't think EO should be on the level of a Becky Lynch and a Bianca Belair and Charlotte Flair and Bailey and Sasha, I don't know what the fuck you're doing here, man. I really don't. I really don't. Speaking of NXT, there are two more NXT stars that are being considered for a main roster call-up on the Observer. Meltzer mentioned that two stars have been on the radar for main roster management, and that is Zion Quinn... <laughs> and Sangha. Apparently, WWE has an eye for both. WWE officials think that Quinn is the total package, which is a positive sign for his future. It's unclear what the plan is for them if they're called up or what brand they will be a part of. Meltzer says in that quote, I'll tell you what. Both of these guys, Sangha and Zion Quinn, are being considered for the main roster right now. Yeah, they think Quinn is the total package. Quinn signed in uh, 2018 with WWE before making his NXT TV debut in August of 2020. He did work an episode of SmackDown by being an enhancement talent where he lost to Sheamus before his NXT debut. Sangha was also signed by WWE in 2018, but he had prior experience as he was involved in TNA's Indian project Ring Ka King, and he made his NXT debut in 2020 working as one half of, you guys remember, Indus Share, where they later uh, split them up. And now we have Veer on the main roster and Sangha is in NXT. Uh, they were, I believe, with Jinder Mahal at one point as well. In January of this year, he returned to NXT. Sangha is not ready. Zion Quinn is not ready either. All I look at when I look at Sangha is uh, another, uh, another uh, big guy that looks very similar to what we got with Braun Strowman when he was there. I mean, he's changing outfits uh, like the regular on the daily in NXT weekly here. Uh, one time he came out legitimately looking like the Indian Braun Strowman. And the other time he comes out looking like Bill Goldberg wearing nothing but black trunks and fucking gloves. I, I don't know what they have planned for Sangha. But Sangha is not main roster ready, and neither is Zion Quinn. Zion Quinn may be one of the worst professional wrestlers on the NXT roster at this point. Since 2018, he's been there. It's four years now, and he doesn't look like he's had training for four years. He doesn't look like he's in-ring ready. But WWE, they don't really put an aspect and a priority on in-ring ready. They look at Zion Quinn, they look at his body type, and they look at his aesthetics, and they look at the total package that he is and, and what he looks like, and that's all they care about. They, they feel like everything else will come when it comes, and Zion Quinn, we want this type of guy on the main roster, and I do believe, I, correct me if I'm wrong, he may be Samoan. So, 
WWE clearly sees all of this, minus the in-ring work, and deems him ready for the main roster just on the way he looks, based on the way he looks. I don't get it. There are, there are several others on that roster that I would deem ready for a main roster run right now, and neither of them include Sangha and Zion Quinn. Carmelo Hayes is ready. Cameron Grimes is ready. Tony D'Angelo will be ready, right? Santos Escobar is fucking ready. You want to call up fucking Zion Quinn and Sangha, but you got Santos Escobar and the rest of Legato wasting away down there, not making money with how talented they fucking are on the main roster. Imagine Santos Escobar still in NXT on NXT 2.0. Who the fuck is running shit down there? Oh, I know. Unbelievable, man. What a dumb fucking move that would. Nobody, I can't even stand Zion Quinn on Tuesdays when I watch him. I got to watch him on Friday or Monday. What we not need. More guys on the main roster that can't fucking wrestle and generate zero buzz and interest. And finally, guys, reason why AEW moved Jim Ross to Rampage on this week's Rampage on Friday. Fans may have noticed that Jim Ross was only on commentary for the main event of Wednesday's episode of AEW Dynamite that featured pre predominantly the Blood and Guts match, which took up the entire second hour of the show. As usual, Ross came out to his, you know, regular theme music, and he received a big pop from the fans in attendance in Detroit. It was later announced that the legendary broadcaster would also call the entire Rampage episode that was taped on Wednesday night and will air on TNT tonight. During the Observer Radio, uh, Meltzer noted that AEW is experimenting with a shakeup for the commentary team. Finally. He says, and I quote, So real quick, the deal with JR is it looks like at least this week, because they're doing an experiment, it looks like JR will do the second hour of Dynamite, and he's going to be moved to Rampage on Fridays as well. So he announces the entire Rampage show this Friday. Since AEW was launched in 2019, Ross has been the definitive voice of the promotion alongside Excalibur. AEW does change up the commentary teams a lot for all of their shows, as there will be different color commentators used during their programmings, whether that be Tony Schiavone, Taz, Paul White, Chris Jericho, William Regal, and more. Jim Ross has yet to publicly comment on this change. I love JR. I think JR is great. Obviously, JR is uh, not in his prime anymore. Obviously, JR is very forgetful uh, more times than we care to remember. But the shakeup of the commentary teams, I feel, is a great move for Tony Khan and AEW. Number one, it gives Jim Ross a special attraction feel. And Jim Ross, at this stage of his career, should be used as a special attraction. He should be used uh, during... You know, not the entire show, but only maybe a half of a show. Or you want to use him for a couple of the major main event matches on a pay-per-view or a major main event match on Dynamite. Or the second hour of Dynamite that bleeds into the last uh, third hour, which is a Rampage taping that is taped usually after Dynamite for Friday the same week. I don't mind that. I don't mind that at all. I'm not going to really miss Jim Ross when he's not there, but I will appreciate him when he is there because we'll hear less of him. Excalibur is more than ready to take the role of a lead comment. Now, I'd, uh, listen, I, I'd go out and get Moro, but that's just me. Uh, but Excalibur, I don't think that's going to happen. But Excalibur is more than ready to take the reins as the lead commentator. Uh, I don't really get the three-man booth. I've always hated a three-man booth. I've hated it in WWE. I hate doing it at Hog. I don't like a three-man booth. I don't. I think it's oversaturated. I think there's too many opinions. I think there's too many voices, and people step over each other and get uh, mixed up. Uh, in translation, a little bit too often. I honestly think it should be Excalibur and Tony Schiavone for Dynamite. And if they want a special uh, guest commentator, whether that's a punk or a page or an MJF, or, or you guys get the gist of it. Tony Schiavone and Excalibur for Wednesday. And then you want to do Excalibur and Tony Schiavone on Friday with Jim Ross there as a special, you know, commentator every week. That's fine. That's fine. Jericho there one week. Maybe Shivani gets out. You want to do Ricky Starks, get him out. You want to do Taz, get him out. Have a nice rotation of color commentators. I wish they had a set team for Friday and a set team for Wednesday, but I don't think that is going to be likely at this stage of the game. I, I do think they're going to continue rotating commentators out. But I, I will say this. With, with Jim Ross being on the Friday night show, I honestly also do think that this is Tony Khan's way of making Rampage feel a little bit more special and a little bit more as a bigger deal. 
Because right now, you know, a lot of people have this impression that Rampage is a very missable show. And on most weeks, I'm being honest with you, it is a very missable show. You know, I don't really care to watch it every Friday. Sometimes I wish I could save it for Saturday morning instead of doing it on Friday and talking about it on Friday. But I think it's Tony Khan and his mentality trying to make Rampage feel a little bit more special with Excalibur there and Jim Ross and and Tony Schiavone being there or Taz being there. I I think he's trying to make it feel as important as Dynamite, because I know a lot of people don't feel like it's as important as Dynamite right now, and it's just an extra hour of television that AEW seemingly needs to have but doesn't really care about. So I do think that he's trying to build Rampage into a second brand, and I do think this is one of his first priorities, and getting this squared away, and then everything after that, whatever may come, is going to come in the order of Tony Khan and his priorities. I I do think that this is a way to make Rampage feel a little bit more special and a little bit more on par with what we see and hear on AEW Dynamite. I could be wrong, but the way Tony Khan works, I would not be surprised if that is the mentality about moving Jim Ross over to Rampage. Let me know what you guys think down below in the comments section as it is yours. Sound off in the comments. Let me know what you think of the top stories. Let me know what you think about Logan Paul, Jim Ross, EO, Shirai, possibly being a free agent at the end of the month. Let me know, man. Hit that thumbs up. 1,000 likes is the minimum on today's OTS Extra. And make sure you guys follow me on social media at JD from NY206. I will be live for SmackDown and Rampage tonight from the OTS venue. So make sure you guys RSVP to the party tonight. We will be live on YouTube at 11.15 Eastern Time. Hope to see you guys there. And make sure you guys go and hit that thumbs up. 1,000 minimum on today's OTS extra. Guys, I'll see you tonight for OTS and SmackDown right here on YouTube live from the venue. See you guys later.